How's everyone doing? <laughs> awesome. Well, we're happy to be here and uh, happy to see all of you. Thanks for coming. Uh, Toby, you've uh, founded a remarkable company. And Thank if you. I'm not mistaken, it's uh, valued at about $15 billion. Uh, and uh, as I understand, it also has pretty humble origins that uh, you began by trying to start a uh, snowboarding business and somehow ended up starting Shopify. Could you just uh, take us through that? Um, uh, by the way, I was driven here today by uh, a guy who uses Shopify. Oh, yes. Uh, he's got a new business. He's selling a product that's supposed to help uh, athletes recover faster. And so he had all kinds of good things to say about Shopify. That's awesome. <laughs> so tell us, just tell us a little bit about uh, how it all happened. How did you start with a small idea that became a really big company? Yeah, it's a, it's a story of taking one step at a time. So um, it, it's true, and uh, this was in 2004, I did, um, uh, I, I, I just moved to Canada, um, and uh, I was spending my, uh, you know, the winters, I'm from Germany, the winters are a lot longer than I used to from Germany, it turns out. <laughs> um, surprise to no one uh, in North America, um, but news to me. And um, so I ended up spending a lot of time snowboarding. Uh, I needed uh, something to do. Uh, I did not yet have a work permit, um, so I um, I tried to get a job, but then people told me that uh, you do actually need a work permit for this. And um, luckily, someone pointed out at some point to me that um, you don't actually need a work permit to start your own business <laughs> because you're not technically working um, until uh, it's working. And um, uh, probably presuming that it would go nowhere anyways. And at that least that I'm would sorry, be busy. I, couldn't hear, I couldn't understand that. What was that? Um, I think the person was presuming that uh, my business wouldn't go anywhere and, and therefore I would never have to register it and therefore it would be perfectly legal. <laughs> <laughs> so I ended up um, um, combining my background as a computer programmer, um, uh, and, uh, my technical abilities with, with snowboards. I built an online store called Snow Devil, um, sold a good deal of snowboards uh, in, in, the, in, in, the, in the wonderful environment of 2004. I, I was the only person advertising on uh, the names of all the ski resorts on, on Google. <laughs> um, uh, I think I paid 20 cents per click. It was wonderful. Um, and um, uh, But the interesting story was I tried to build a business uh, using existing software. That, that was essentially impossible given what I wanted to do. And I ended up building the software along the way. And um, after a successful season, um, we ended up realizing that um, we would either, in, in, you know, people stop buying snowboards in the summer, it turns out. Um, so we uh, either needed to sell skateboards, but at this point, a, a few people asked me if I could license the software I wrote. And so the idea for Shopify really came from that. People, people wanted this software and um, um, spent about another two years working on it and then started selling it as Shopify. And uh, specifically, what about the software was unique? Why did you have to develop your own software, and why did people want to use it? Yeah, um, so it turns out um, um, this was unclear to me in the beginning, but then I found fig figured it out later. Um, it is true that there was software, like there was, um, um, I mean, there was multiple systems which are shopping cart software. Um, but all of them were built for existing businesses that wanted to also sell online. Um, because that was the world, right? Like everyone needed an online strategy in right. early 2000s. There wasn't anyone who built software that was specifically um, to support people who start new businesses online, and which is a very different challenge. Suddenly, things like um, how difficult is it <laughs> um, really, really matter because these are not veterans of the retail industry attempting these kind of things. I should, I certainly wasn't. It was people who um, used their lunch breaks to make a reach for independence. Those are people who, um, uh, and I think this is a large group of people in the world, for who often the kindergarten to school to college to corporate job thing is, uh, is not the right way to go, or would at least attempt to build something uh, themselves and engage in this wonderful thing of entrepreneurship. And so, um, I needed to build um, uh, Shopify for those reasons. There was also a couple of other reasons. One is, this was really the dawn of um, 
what was called Web 2.0, which we sort of make fun of now. But Web 2.0 was really um, the technology industry raising its hand and saying, we figured out how to make internet software. We didn't figure it out in the 90s. We pretended we did, but we didn't actually do it. Uh, now we know how to make internet software. Um, and the beginning of software as a service, which means that you can actually sign yourself up for software and you don't have to talk to salespeople and negotiate and get an install. <coughs> it's just sort of self-serve. So all these things came together uh, and really required me to like, like, like let's, let's, let's utilize these ideas, build software that's very approachable, that specifically helps entrepreneurs have an experience very similar to my Snow Devil story and um, build a business around that. That's uh, exactly the situation that uh, my limo driver uh, was in. I mean, here, I mean, he's really driving a limo every morning. And uh, early in the morning, he gets home at about 10 or 11 o'clock, and he starts working on his business. And he's got a good business. He's got a good product. I love that. And he's had some um, uh, professional uh, athletic teams buy his product, and he's doing well there. And now his next step is to go to general consumers. And that's what he's using uh, Shopify for. But that's his situation. Amazing he's story, <laughs> right? <laughs> Amazing story. And so... Here's the um, here's a crazy stat about Shopify. It's, so we have about um, 600,000 businesses that use Shopify. Every 60 seconds, someone gets their first sale. Wow. So every 60 seconds, someone is like that, um, the, per the person you met, and um, they go from uh, an experience of building something to being a um, like a, an entrepreneur because someone else validated that this thing that they built needed to exist. This is such a profound experience. I, I can tell you, um, this was back in 2004 when I, I, I opened my laptop in a coffee shop that I always went to do, to, to do my work. And um, there was an email waiting for me uh, from Snow Devil saying that someone from Pennsylvania ordered Snowboard. And um, it's funny because I, I, I wrote the software. I actually wrote that email at some point <laughs> to, to be <laughs> which the software sent to me. Yeah. Uh, but it was still profound. Um, and it was profound because um, I, I, I remember everything about this day. And I fell so in love with this um, concept that I, I just, I, I, I somehow felt like someone gave me this gift of insight into how powerful the potential is of this. And now I need to dedicate my life to like, developing this and then sharing it with, uh, with other people. You're really like the Johnny Appleseed of entrepreneurship. You're making it possible for uh, uh, small people who are not in a business to start a business uh, and do it online. And I think it's important that I, I wish a lot more people would do it, right? Because um, here's, here's the interesting story about, like, let, let's zoom out on entrepreneurship for a moment. This is, should be very relevant to this conference. Um, the narrative I think we've all seen is entrepreneurship is uh, two people with a laptop in a coffee store or uh, two people in a, in a garage, it's usually guys, right? Um, uh, building some next billion dollar tech startup, some app, whatever, right? This is sort of the enforced vision of entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. Now that's a very, very, very small group of people who can have any shot at doing that. Only people who, um, kind of a pretty similar to me, middle class kid, um, spent way too much time with computers growing up, <laughs> know how to program them, yeah. and have essentially, like, I, I, I mean, I essentially skipped my childhood to learn programming, right? And that I was totally cool, that was the most interesting thing that happened, but it's not generally something that most people do, right? For very, for very good reasons. Um, and so, uh, so what we actually have done is we made entrepreneurship uh, much cheaper for m f almost no people, like very few people. Um, and the effect of that is profound because entre entrepreneurship worldwide is in decline. There's a lot fewer companies that are being started now than uh, 10 years ago. Uh, and 10 years before that, it's the lowest it's ever been. Um, success rates are also not doing great. And so it's interesting because uh, if you listen to uh, politicians, all, all countries, um, they talk about entrepreneurship as being the driver of economy. It's an yes. like innovation engine. That's where all the goodness comes from. We right. love entrepreneurship. But no one's actually doing anything about it, and it's actually going away. And partly the reason for why it's going away is because <coughs> what the Internet is doing is it is massively reinforcing um, centralization. 
um, in, even in the world of Walmart, which centralized a lot of sort of the mom and pop shops, still there were small communities which still needed a general store. That was still the opportunity for an entrepreneur, an ent opportunity for a family to jump in, do something that um, replicated this idea of the uh, um, general store in a smaller community, and then the small community needed a butcher and, and all, all these kind of things. Um, but the internet only needs one Amazon, right? Uh, so the possibility space is really, really shrinking. Um, you, you almost, no matter what you do, you're always competing with the entire planet rather than just your local street. And that this, so this all happens against a backdrop, going back to the retail industry, of an, of, of an industry that's going from, uh, currently it's $1.9 trillion mm -hmm. in size, substantial. Um, it's, going to another f uh, it's, it's going to $4 trillion over the next couple of years. This may be the single biggest economic opportunity in the world right now. Yet we are mostly talking about tech startups. So if no one goes ahead and tries to build a company um, or a, a business model, um, which really is what's called a reinforcing loop around helping everyone, helping small people, helping the people building a um, um, uh, affiliate supply store while not driving their limo or in uh, building a cosmetics brand in their lunch break. Um, if no one enables them, this entire massive economic expansion, um, two trillion dollar expansion, is going to go to the already established players. And I guess you can imagine what that does for inequality, right? So I, I think I, I, I would want a lot more people to do this. I think we need to figure out how to build business models that really, really in reinforce and uh, uh, have the effect in the world that we actually need. Because my belief about the future of economy is that we don't need five additional mega companies. What we actually need is millions of 20 people, small businesses. Right, right. And so this is uh, something that's uh, very dear to my my heart and something that I hope Shopify helps with. You know, I, I uh, quizzed my limo driver on the way over here, of course, and uh, he made it seem that it was pretty inexpensive to, to use Shopify. Uh, I think he said there was a sliding scale and that, uh, I mean, he said he was paying uh, 30 bucks a month plus a percentage of sales. Mm -hmm. uh, it sounded pretty reasonable for, for the small entrepreneur. Most, uh, it's true. Most of our customers spend more money on lattes than on Shopify, which is uh, in the money. So <laughs> I think that's, uh, um, again, capital is one of the big hurdles, right? Like, so just in terms of timeline, what, what we've done since we launched is um, we're trying, like our belief is that every m bit of complexity, like really where like you would scratch your head about how do you go forward building a business um, means a lot of people stop. Uh, yeah. It's not a crazy assumption. This is clearly true and reflected in the data. So what we spend most of our time on is figuring out what are these things that people quit over and can we somehow make them go away? So um, um, not having a lot of capital ahead of time is one of those things. I right. can tell you when I needed, <coughs> when I started Snow Devil, I couldn't get a payment gateway um, because of my lack of credit hi history. And so I had to post a $20,000 bond with a bank to uh, get the, um, be allowed to have a payment gateway. Now, again, did you have $20,000? I, I managed to scrounge it together um, from, from family, which again talk, talks about how privileged I am. Right? If, 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 if I would have been born in a different situation, this wouldn't have been possible and I wouldn't be sitting here. So um, how, like how many amazing entrepreneurs have we not met and have not actually accomplished what they ought to accomplish because of friction like this? Right, right. And so, um, so what we're doing is like, okay, so let's make it as affordable as possible to enable. Let's um, give everyone a payment gateway. Let's um, become people's source of funding. Like fundraising is hard. We can do cash at once. It's everything we are doing at Shopify. I'm sorry, do you loan people money who want to who want to use Spo uh, Storify? Yeah. I, I mean, uh, Spotify? Yeah, Shopify. Shopify? Sorry. <laughs> All of it? <laughs> um, yes, we do. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's one component of a, of a business. Again, um, we wish we wouldn't. We wish we didn't have to, frankly, because I think we, have a, we ought to be the wrong group of people to do it. Um, I'm a great believer that everyone in should really play their role and their position, um, and I want the banks to give money to small businesses. 
the banks are not giving money to small businesses anymore. It's it's just too much trouble for them. It's too hard for them to get the data. It's um, uh, it, it, it's too much maintenance. They want they want to give a lot of money to companies like me, <laughs> um, right. because that's one single client and uh, and it's safe. And, and well, <coughs> hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, so so we had to get in the business of uh, advances on people's revenue, so that we can say that uh, we know you from all the data that we already have. Um, we think you're going to be this successful. Do you want this money now so that you can reinvest in a business and build a bigger business? Let me ask you something just a little bit more personal, which is uh, I'm curious about how you uh, got to Canada mm. uh, and, and why uh, you ended up moving to Canada. Yeah, uh, yeah best reason. My, my wife is Canadian, so... <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I, it's funny, though. I grew up, again, 80s, 90s in Germany, which is, uh, I think, the peak of... Um, uh, United States mania in Germany. Um, like uh, everything cool in the world came from the United States, and uh, um, uh, the European Union was sort of growing up around uh, around us in Germany. And for very good reasons, Germans aren't allowed to be super into Germany because <laughs> everyone gets nervous if they do. Um, um, so we, we always identified as Europeans, um, and. Uh, Yet all the good, all the, everything that's good and modern, and uh, especially in technology, came from the United States. So I always um, saw myself as moving to the United States at some point. Um, and I. Uh, how, how old were you when you moved to the, the U.S.? I was. I mean, to Canada. Twenty-one. Yeah. 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 So I, I, I mean, I, I figured I was, you know, Canada was uh, closer to the United States. So, like, putting I'm on the right trajectory to the United States, but then I also figured out that Canada is essentially the United States for Europeans. <laughs> so uh, I, that, that's where I put down roots, and it's a great place. But I bet a lot of people ask you why you don't move to Silicon Valley. Yeah, I did. I, I mean, I had lots of opportunity to. Um, I um, uh, got a wonderful term sheet once from, I think from Sequoia um, in 2008 um, that said, okay, we investment company, this much money on this valuation, and uh, but you have to relocate the company to Silicon Valley because clearly nothing interesting could possibly ha be happening outside of Silicon Valley, um, was definitely the general thought in 2008. Um, and so I, I went and uh, I, I studied, like uh, back then there was no term for unicorns and the billion dollar company almost never happened. Um, but I went, um, figured out all the ones which did happen and, and looked at, frankly, a geographical distribution. And I found out that, yeah, there might be twice as many, I think, as what I ended up <coughs> finding, um, a bit, little bit more than twice as many successful billion-dollar companies in uh, Silicon Valley. But past that, it seems that the force that creates really great companies um, wasn't being in Silicon Valley, but rather was that these companies created a, a, a broad geographical consensus that they are the best companies to work for. And so I, I, I sort of ran the calculus on this and I decided it was just going to be much easier to um, create this geographical consensus that Shopify is going to be the best company to work for um, across uh, a, a small portfolio of Canadian cities. So we, we, we are um, headquarters in Ottawa, but we have very large offices in Toronto, Montreal, and Waterloo. Um, which actually ended up being a, a brilliant place for starting a company like Shopify. And so we, we went with that instead, and it worked out. I see. Um, tell me a little bit about your educational background. My understanding, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is that uh, you came up through the apprentice system yeah. uh, in Germany rather than a sort of more traditional uh, uh, university education. Can you, can you uh, explain, or high school education, can you explain what that's about and, and why you think it might be advantageous? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a great... Um, I think it's one of the uh, more inspired bits of, uh, of, of, of German culture. Um, it's uh, like, um, I was a rotten student, absolutely hopeless. I, 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 like I couldn't do anything in school really. Um, <laughs> um, I, uh, I, I managed to squeeze by, uh, by usually um, figuring out um, like how many days I would have to spend in school to get the minimum attendance and get the minimum amount of good grades so that it would average to some to a passing grade and that's the amount of schooling I took. <laughs> um, uh, so um, I tried to get out of school as soon as I could. The, the, the reason by the way was simple. Um, 
computers are just so much more interesting than school. Um, and uh, I, I just wanted to spend time with computers rather than uh, learning about all these things that people seem to want to teach me. I, I tend to, um, I, ten I, I cannot learn, I, I, know I know this now, I didn't learn, uh, know it back then. Um, I cannot learn solutions to problems I never had. You know mm. what I mean? Like sure, it's not concrete enough. Uh, it, it's it's like after I understand the problem, I can spend um, hours or years researching solutions to it. But but until I understand the problem, I can't. So um, school was sort of the opposite, right? It was like like here's the solution to that, 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 that. But don't ask what what this solves. Right? So you don't like working in the abstract. You like something uh, tangible. Uh, in, in fact, I'm quite abstract. It's just it, it just the causality needs to be a, a, a certain way that I think the German school system of circa 1980 um, didn't supply, and so um, uh, I ended up uh, leaving school. And I was also in a very small city, and so on. Um, I, I left school after 10th grade, I, and this was it, this doesn't this is not as radical as it sounds. I did that because uh, uh, there is this dual education system where you can apprentice on in something, and this is really neat. So um, you, for three years, you work for a company. Um, the government pays you, um, the, um, um, you have a master and you are an apprentice under them and uh, you usually... You mean one, one individual that you Yeah, apprentice? one individual. Uh -huh. And then you um, spend usually one day of a week in school and the rest at the company and you work. And that was perfect for me. Um, so my class was the first class ever to apprentice as uh, you, um, computer scientist, so to speak. Not really, that's a rough translation of, an, of the term. Um, but it's uh, it, it, it was it was interesting and hectic and um, good and allowed me to spend um, my entire day programming at a company when I was 16 years old, which was a dream for me. Uh, I had a fantastic mentor, a fantastic person to help me, and uh, yeah, that's my education. Wow, it's very very unique, very unusual. What we um, are doing, like so so uh, I again zooming out a bit. Here's the interesting bit about it, right? Like, um, I mean, it's unusual in the, in the in the U.S. and I imagine Canada as well. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's it's very relevant, right? Like, this is I think here it's more called this is called work integrated learning, right? So, um, Shopify is actually investing very very heavily into a program that we are establishing um, uh, called Dev Degree to bring um, a middle ground between um, high school high school dropout and um, college education to um, uh, this world. This is a program we are doing with a local university and it's fully accredited and you earn money doing your degree. <laughs> so think about how amazing that is compared to what most people do. And um, uh, yeah, so this is something that Shopify is actually trying to build out based on that experience that I had. I, f I feel like we have to experiment more with how to uh, train computer science because it, it's just so different from a lot of other um, sciences. Well, it sounds like a great uh, public service. I, I'm, at least I hope. So the, the, the hope is that we um, establish a new pattern, we will open source it, and then hopefully it will adopt it. Uh, will be adopted in the United States and everywhere where people are interested in having as uh, like a something uh, another path. Is this uh, only in Canada at the moment? It's currently only in Canada. Yes. You know, uh, changing the subject here. Uh, I'm a fan of the television show Billions. I don't know if you've ever seen it. Uh, I have not, no. <laughs> well, it's, uh, uh, it features a uh, hedge fund, and they, uh, the people at this hedge fund, they short sell companies like having a cup of coffee. Oh, yeah, my favorite crowd. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I know that this is something that you've been through and that Shopify has been through, and uh, uh, I think it's fairly recent, if I'm not mistaken. I think about a, year, a bit more than a year ago, maybe, yeah. I would want to say. Uh, so can you tell us... Uh, what happened when when you when this uh, individual uh, short sold your company and how you dealt with it? Um, yeah, um, so it happened very fast and we dealt with it poorly. It's <laughs> um, a um, reality. Was it a surprise? It, it kind of was, right? I so I, I should say like I, I have nothing against the. Uh, in fact, I think um, short selling is a very important mechanic of the, of, of uh, Wall Street. In in why, in is that? why is that important? Why in is it important? Because I think someone should someone should represent the uh, the bear case, especially if there's a lot of bull cases on every company, right? Like someone should say uh, there should always be a descending voice, um, and someone should um, talk 
about the counterfactual to like what what if Toby is wrong and entrepreneurship simply doesn't matter right like what you know <coughs> this is something that I think should be intellectually explored um, and uh, if someone believes that that is the true way we should think about this I think short selling is some is, is a way for this to become uh, something that people can do um, so but here's what happened um, we uh, um, we, we literally woke up in the middle of company being distracted over a reorganization. Um, and uh, there was a short seller who put a, like, did an all front attack on um, YouTube and all of the media um, talking about Shopify being um, a multi level marketing scheme or permit scheme. Um, and that was sort of interesting, right? So you. you like a Ponzi scheme. Pretty much. Yeah. Um, Actually, was it a, was it a hedge fund or a particular individual? Uh, this is uh, Andrew Left. Who uh -huh. was, uh, I forgot the name of the research thing that he okay. runs, but yep. um, um, uh, so, so likened us to uh, I think Herbalife or something or Valiant or something like this, um, using all the right trigger words um, to get everyone to be really worried about uh, Shopify out of a sudden. Uh, so, so here's why I said we reacted poorly. Um, there was a lot of accusations in the video, and it was interesting because um, like I wanted to respond to this, but we really couldn't. We were in a blackout period, um, which happens to you when you're in a public company, um, close to um, uh, the financial uh, statement time, and I, I, this was probably deliberate. And um, um, so like everything, we, we, the way we responded had to be double and triple checked by, by lawyers and all these kind of things. and so. Um, the, the issue that happened then is that uh, there was a vacuum of information from the company and which was filled by and left. <laughs> I and see. Um, that ended up creating a narrative which was just uh, really unfortunate because I, I, it w was um, like I thought we did a pretty good job educating uh, the street and everyone about what the company does. So um, it seemed pretty preposterous for some of those claims, but <coughs> In the absence of any kind of counterclaims, they still got the airtime, and um, Shopify got hit with that. And I, I have to say, it didn't feel great because it's, some, it's sort of like someone attacking um, uh, uh, attacking your family a bit. Um, but hey, it's you live and learn. Well, I imagine it doesn't feel great at all. Um, what what is the upshot? I mean, in, in the uh, it, was there an immediate drop in the stock price, and has the stock price recovered? And yeah, I mean that's the business model, right? Like. Uh, 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 Andrew would have taken a uh, pot potentially substantial uh, short position of Shopify before that, and then fed all this misinformation into the market, um, and on in the in the confusion that ensues, uh, ensues um, you have more people sell than buy, and uh, the stock price drops, and that's how he made money. No. It's so as he made his money, did he sh did oh he, sh yeah. he short sold and then and then uh, when the price dropped he got out? Oh, he's very good at what he's doing. What's that? He's very good at what he's doing, and uh, it's legal what he's doing. Now the question is why, but it's perfectly good to do. And uh, has Shopify recovered? Has the stock price recovered? Uh, I I think it's higher now than it was either before or after this happened. Um, but it uh, I mean. <sighs> I want to take issue with the word recovered, right? Because the, st the stock price and the company are completely independent, right? I, I just, um, like sometimes, so like let's say the stock goes up 10% today. I know for a fact that Shopify did not become 10% better today. And so if it goes 20% down tomorrow, I also know Shopify did not get 20% uh, worse tomorrow. And so, um, so the, the price of the stock is really not, it, like it's, it's really a re real-time view into a brainstorming activity that Wall Street is engaged in. And it's usually wrong, but it's over a long period of time, it will probably work out correctly as a trend line. Mm -hmm. Because the real market value of any company is unknowable. It is impossible to quantify how important, how valuable Shopify is in the world. It's, it's like you can't. But we, we do have a price discovery mechanism that is Wall Street, which works over a long period of time uh, correctly. So 
I, I'm, I'm always a little bit surprised in the way, again, the media sort of talks about companies being either doing well or poorly based on, on, on the stock price because it really doesn't correlate in, in this sort of day-to-day -day way that it sometimes is uh, made out to be. Well, that makes sense to me. I mean, the market, basically, it's a casino. It was, I mean, it's a, it's a bet on whether a, random a, walk, yeah, it's a bet on whether a company will do better or worse uh, in the future. It doesn't really have anything to do with, or has very little to do with what's happening right. today. Right. So um, the separation of tasks here, um, if you follow Adlerian psychology, is that uh, Shopify's task is to every day add a tiny little bit to the unknowable real market value of the business. Um, and we do that by adding merchants, by making it simpler, um, making it more approachable, by um, releasing new features, by having new insights, all these kind of things. And then the task of Wall Street is to figure out what that actually means. And those things are completely separate. In fact, we, have a, um, we, we don't actually allow people to um, check stock prices at Shopify. If you, if, you, if, if you found to check the stock price, you have to buy donuts for everyone on your team next day. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the most interesting things I've heard you say is that commerce is an expression of democracy. And I wondered if you could talk about that a little bit and tell us uh, what you mean. Yeah, um, I was going to lead into a really interesting topic afterwards, I bet. Um, uh, here's what I mean with that. Um, when you purchase something, um, it's, it, you, you might think about this as an acquisition of an item that you wanted, sure. But I'm a systems thinker, and I would like to point out that that purchase reinforces something. Um, <coughs> so what happens is, um, because of your purchase, um, money travels to a merchant. That merchant, that, that's a signal to a merchant. That item is needed. I'm going to get more of them produced. This actually leads to employment. I need more people to help me ship these things. I, all the people um, in the factory that are employed by this are going to like, have better employment or more. If there's two businesses like downtown next to each other, um, and both have the same items, um, and you start buying from one over the other for whatever reason, um, that business will thrive, and everything that business stands for will thrive. So here's what I, um, what I want to um, um, suggest, is that um, I think our purchasing behavior is a significant democratic force in the world. And I actually believe that a lot of people affect the world significantly more throughout their purchases in their lifetime than through the various sort of every four years we go to the ballots and vote for a president kind of thing. Um, because um, every single time you purchase something, you actually cast a vote for not just the product, but everything, the entire philosophy and everything that the company stands for that created the product. And you will, uh, in a subtle way, shift the world in such a way that that company gets more power. If that company is um, uh, like, it sells, uh, happens to sell animal, uh, animal cruelty-free, um, um, fashion, which can happen, um, then um, you're actually shifting the world into the direction of that. That means they need a bigger supply chain. That means there need to be more animals raised in, a, in, a, in, in one way rather than another, and so on and so on. This is really how the world becomes what it is, uh, and it's, it's a very powerful force. And so that's what I mean with um, that products and especially purchasing and the transactions are a significant part of our um, uh, expression and our p power in the world. I think this is actually a very hot topic right, right at this moment. Uh, and I want to talk about a few things. One is your experience. Um, uh, you probably guessed I was going to ask you this. One is your experience with uh, deciding to separate from Breibart, but also uh, the experience of the New Yorker magazine festival uh, deciding to um, invite Steve Bannon as a speaker and then rescinding the invitation after, after a lot of objections from uh, people uh, on, on, in social media and also from their, their own company. And third, uh, the decision by Nike to use uh, the controversial uh, football quarterback, Colin Kaepernick, as on, the, on the logo and it's for the logo in its latest uh, Just Do It campaign. So 
uh, I think all of these things are, are, are coming together and, that, and the issue of commerce as, a, uh, as an expression of democracy seems suddenly very real. So I wondered if you could just talk a little bit about uh, your experience with Breibart. Uh, initially, you defended the decision to stay with Breibart and then decided, uh, as, as, I, as it seemed to me, I was reading your website, you felt you almost had no choice, I think. But tell me about that evolution. Let, let me, yeah. Um, so, so Breitbart used, uh, runs their store on Shopify. And uh, now again, we are a Canadian um, company, right? So like it's, we sometimes have to go and educate ourselves a little bit about what's happening in the United States um, uh, in, in, in when we get oh, into yeah, sure. uh, debates. Um, um, this is actually true even sometimes there's a European thing happening and we have to figure out what happens there. So sometimes we have a little bit of an outside perspective which can help or can hinder. Right. But um, um, we have, uh, like, we decided, I, I mean, again, I should say, I'm an engineer. Engineer, as an engineering uh, uh, minded person, I really wish we would solve problems at um, the right layer, like where yeah. they ought to be solved. This is why I said earlier, I wish your banks would give people money. That's why you kind of made banks, right? <laughs> it's funny, G banks are at this point just vaults for, uh, instead of f facilitating um, entrepreneurship. Um, in the same way, I think every country should really figure out the way it wants to act based on its laws. Um, and so the uh, United States is okay with some things, Europe is not okay with other things. This is sort of happens to a certain degree, and I think this is how we should have these conversations. And I think it's very problematic to go around and ask all the platforms to um, be, be another layer like a hot fix on top of a broken um, legal system of saying, I want you to enforce another set of values than the country decided on. Um, so uh, uh, I, I do not agree with Breitbart's worldview in the slightest. I'm quite liberal, um, but I, uh, uh, we have a, um, uh, we, we adhere to the laws of the countries we operate in and then we have um, uh, something called an acceptable use policy, which we had to create because the, la uh, the laws are inadequate um, in some ways. Like for instance, there isn't a country which has figured out what hate speech actually is. So uh, I, I don't know why everyone is trying to skirt around it because it is actually somewhat definable. Um, so we had to create a definition and that is our acceptable use policy. Um, are no. you saying, excuse me, are you saying that there's a, almost a new ethic that's evolving online and that the legal system can't keep up with it? Yeah, I think that, I mean, uh, this is not surprising. The internet is just so fast that everyone is kind of um, hit flat-footed by it. Uh, there's also a significant amount of political gridlock in many countries, um, which means it's very non-plausible to, to update laws of what's acceptable and what isn't um, in real time as things happen. Um, uh, you know, a good example of that is things like ghost guns, which just didn't exist a while ago. This is people um, 3D printing guns, right? This is something which I think is running to the Supreme Court now. Um, yes. But it's, uh, um, they're, they're, they're real and exist, right? So um, it's, it's, it's hard to be agile enough to accommodate all these things. So um, we we decided to say, um, to, to hold Breitbart to the requirements or, you know, what is like, like the products they sold, the, um, uh, you know, needed to adhere to our acceptable use policy, but they are really good at making it all adhere to the acceptable use policy. And therefore we did not find them to be offending in such a way that we had, um, that we had to, uh, um, delist them. And that remains to be true to this day. Um, so, so they are, uh, they are using the platform. Yeah, the grander conversation is, I think, like I think right now is the time where I think the internet is trying to figure out what role the platforms need to play. And I think I, I, I welcome this debate. And I just want to also say that everyone, um, I certainly, I reserve the right to wake up smarter every day. And I think um, that um, our decisions, we, we have to constantly revisit our decisions and look at to see if they are the right ones given the changing natures, uh, nature of the world. A good example is the gun, uh, ghost gun issue. Um, like we, we did 
um, we, we did amend our acceptable use policy against it. Um, I know in the United States, um, like because so here's what people people were selling. People were selling um, uh, um, all the parts of a gun that you can sell freely before it is a gun, plus a 3D printer, plus a blueprint to print the missing part, right? And so. Um, uh, like in the United States, guns are legal in general, so it's not that big of an issue. Um, but in all other countries, pretty much, they're not legal, but ghost guns are. So being a global platform with people and customers in every country in the world, we had to say, okay, this is going to take too long for every country to understand the potential impact of, of this particular product that otherwise couldn't be legally sold. We need to step in and say, okay, we can't have uh, a, a store in uh, every, uh, in every. Uh, you can't wait for the legal system cat to, or the legislative process to catch up. Yeah. Well, I think that's fascinating. Uh, let me ask you this. Uh, let's say, uh, since uh, commerce is an expression of democracy, uh, Let's say that the decision to separate from Bybart was an effect of a vote. Uh, and let's say the decision by Nike uh, to use uh, Colin Kaepernick uh, on its logo was also casting a, a vote on an issue that where there's a pretty sharp uh, divide, at least in the United States. Would you agree with that? Or, or? I do. Um, I mean, I, I definitely just agree that those are very tough choices that are you can probably not even imagine how much de internal debate companies are having about these things. It is the defining issue of the times, I think. Um, was this controversial within your within your own company? Yeah, it was very um, because again, no one like again we are, we we are a company situated in probably the most liberal cities in the most liberal country, <laughs> um, uh, and um, so but we had to make a choice saying we are not going to impose our worldview on, on the world. We want that there needs to be room to meet other people. Like we, we, I, I'm, this is personal, but I'm, I, I believe in comprehensivism. Like I, I, I really want to understand both sides of every argument. I really want um, uh, to, you know, I really, really uh, value spending time with uh, people with a significant more conservative bent, because um, once you understand their story, you realize it, it's just, you can't simply dismiss everything they're saying out of hand. It comes from a world, it comes from a set of experiences that we actually can absolutely reason about. And um, I, I, I value this intellectual debate, and I think that um, turning off all the platforms to put the potential of this. I mean, look, look back, back in history, right? Like um, Frost Nixon, right? Local example. Um, that was people of two completely opposing views sitting down over days and having a um, conversation. So, so exactly. why are we uninviting Steve Bannon? Like, why not? Like, I, I, I know, I know. Um, I agree with nothing that he does, and absolutely not with his worldview. But clearly, the better we understand it, the easier it is going to be for uh, people to poke holes in it and have a conversation about um, how to how to move forward here. And I think actually the economists also ended up saying that they will actually not rescind an invitation to Steve Bannon. So I didn't under I didn't hear that. Is that right? It's an interesting. That is, yeah. yeah there's an, I, I think there may be a slowly emerging difference of approach between Europe and North America, which is another kind of interesting factor in all this. So uh, you would not agree with the New Yorker magazine's decision to disinvite Steve Bannon to their festival? I, I, I would, I would, I can do whatever they want, but I would rather have uh, seen um, a, a conversation. Well, some folks might say, well, didn't in effect you do the same thing by distancing yourself from uh, Breitbart? So we, uh, we are still hosting Breitbart. We what, what's that? We are still hosting Breitbart. We, have, um, uh, we, we, are, we are in exactly the same position we were um, a year ago. Um, we say we are, we are not fans, but we, are, we have them on our platform, and they are governed by an acceptable use policy that they have to adhere to, um, which, by the way, we, we do delist stores frequently under. Like it's... Um, Bright, Breitbart is just not at the line before it gets into the territory that we, um, that, that we really have to police. I see. 
You know, uh, we're just about uh, out of time, uh, unfortunately, because I think this is a fascinating uh, issue and a fascinating conversation. Is there a final uh, thought you'd like to express before we uh, say farewell to our audience? I mean, that's just, um, um, I mean, uh, uh, thank you for the conversation. I, I, I'm super passionate on the topics of uh, um, uh, exploration of um, um, this sort of concept of voting by the purchases, but also really taking this massive opportunity that exists and figuring out more ways to make this available to, to, to people who otherwise might not have the option to engage in this sort of reach for independence and uh, build their own businesses. I, I again remember everything about the moment um, that I had my first sale and um, the more people can have uh, an experience like this, I think the better we're all off. Like my limo driver this morning. Exactly. Hey, thanks everybody for coming. We really appreciate it. Thank you.